Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to this April the 8th meeting of the Public Safety Committee. As always, we'd like to start by recognizing the leadership of our, of our public safety departments. Uh, joining us today, we have uh, the leader of the police department, uh, Chief Thompson, who's here representing the brave men and women of the police department. Representing the brave uh, women and men of the fire department, we have Chief Mayo. Thank you for being here today. And the brave men and women of the emergency management department, Mr. August Vernon, we thank you for being here today. I'd like to recognize our public safety attorney, uh, Lois Sykes, our city attorney, Angela Carmen, city manager, uh, Mr. Garrity, and everyone who helps to make this city a better place to live, work, and relax. Uh, we have just a few items on the general agenda. Uh, there is an item giving a presentation from the DWI task force. Uh, there is an item requesting uh, some from Smith Reynolds Airport to allow the use of rifles for wildlife control on airport grounds. And then lastly, there will be an update on the complex coordinated terrorist attacks grant. Uh, there is a consent agenda that needs to be voted on. Items on the consent agenda are approved one uh, sweeping motion unless it's a member of this committee or the council wishes an item to be pulled for consideration. Uh, with that being said, members of the committee or council, are there any items that should be pulled for consideration? If not, I consider a motion. Mayor Pro Tempur, we'll pull item C1. Any other items? Motion to approve the balance. There is a motion. Second. And if properly seconded. All in favor of approving the balance of the consent agenda, please vote yes. Oppose us likewise. Uh, that is unanimous, uh, with the exception of item C1. Uh, if you read that item, please, ma'am. Item C1, ordinance amending section 42-97 of the city code relating to weight limitation on through traffic on certain city streets located in the southeast ward. Mayor Pro Tem Burke is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I did not have anything against this. I brought this up because there are streets that trucks are going through that's not meeting the requirements. They're going all through our neighborhoods, and, and I think it's something. Who's head of that department, Mr. City Manager? Mr. DeCane has been looking at that, that issue. All right. Well, whenever the citizens call us and maybe they can call you, we would like for that to be looked at very carefully. They would not be going in some of the other neighborhoods uh, like they're going through ours. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all I wanted to bring to attention. Yes, ma'am. Would you like to put a motion on the floor? for approval. All right. There's a motion to approve C1. Is there a second? Second. Make the motion. I move. Second. Approval. Okay. Uh, all in favor, please vote yes. Opposes likewise. The consent agenda has been approved unanimously. We will move to our general agenda. Uh, first item on the agenda is item G1, please. Item G1, DWI Task Force presentation. Thank you for being here today. It looks like queuing us up here is Assistant Chief Weaver. Uh, Assistant Chief Weaver, you have the floor. Good evening, Chairman Taylor, Good evening. Pro Tem Burke, other members of the Public Safety Committee. Good evening. Thought I'd bring you something to make you a little proud, if you don't mind. <laughs> On Friday, March 22nd, the Forsyth County DWI Task Force won the Mothers Against Dr Drunk Driving 2018 North Carolina DWI Task Force of the Year. All right. wow. That's right. about right. Woo yeah. Our Forsyth County DWI Task Force was formed on October 1, 2010, after obtaining a grant from the North Carolina Governor's Highway Safety Program. The grant was the first of its kind to fund a DWI-only task force within North Carolina. The initial grant was for four years and was comprised of members from the Kernersville Police Department, the Forsyth County Sheriff's Office, and the Winston-Salem Police Department, with the Winston-Salem Police Department serving as the supervising agency. During the fifth year of operation, the Kernersville Police Department applied for a new grant-funded position and another member was added. As of October 1st, 2018, the Forsyth County DWI Task Force started its ninth year of operation. The Forsyth County DWI Task Force members saw early on that education was a key component to combating the problems that Forsyth County was facing related to DWI offenses and impaired driving-related fatalities. During the first eight years of operation, the Forsyth County DWI Task Force has charged over 4,800 offenders with DWI. There were 11,700 other related traffic charges, over 1,100 drug-related charges, and we have seized over 450 vehicles from repeat DWI offenders. With the early focus on education and impact, and that's spelled I-M-P-A-C-T, 
class was created, which discusses the dangers of driving while impaired, and it's taught to driver education classes throughout the Winston-Salem Forsyth County school system. During the past eight years, our DWI task force members have taught 450 classes to over 16,400 students. In addition, the Forsyth County DWI task force assists with teen driver events, safe and sober prom events, health fairs, and any other opportunities that we can find to get our message across and prevent persons from making poor decisions to drive while impaired. And I'd like to give uh, you some information on the special award one with Corporal Hanks, if you'll step up, please. This is Corporal T.S. Hanks. He was one of the founding members of the Forsyth County DWI Task Force, and for 2018, he has received the Heart of MAD award winner. Over eight years, he's been dedicated to DWI enforcement only. He has certifications as a drug recognition expert and instructor, a standardized field sobriety testing instructor. He's also certified as a North Carolina general law enforcement instructor. Corporal Hanks has also been awarded certificates from the Forensic Test for Alcohol Branch for achievement on outstanding efforts as a drug recognition expert as well as outstanding performance as a standardized field sobriety testing instructor. Corporal Hanks is tasked with teaching all of our new recruits the standardized field sobriety testing course of instruction as well as all refresher training within the Winston-Salem Police Department. He also teaches the high school impact courses that is taught to the driver education classes throughout the Winston-Salem Forsyth County School System. And Corporal Hanks has also taught a wellness class for City of Winston-Salem employees on poor choices have bad consequences related to DWI awareness. Corporal Hanks has assisted with alcohol prevention talks and education during teen driver safety events, health fairs, and to call sororities. During his career, Corporal Hanks has charged over 1,600 people with driving while impaired. Ladies and gentlemen, your DWI task force. Oh. Thank you, Chief. I'll say to Corporal Hanks, uh, thank you uh, both individually. And, and collectively to the rest of the task force. Thank you all individually and collectively. Uh, our city is better off with you being in it, and we just appreciate the work that you do. Is there any members of the committee that would have any words? No Councilman Ballard. Well, I echo the same comments that the chairman, and it makes our city a better place because brave men, and I want some women also to <laughs> step out to help and save us. Thank you. Here, here. Could, could you remind me what the number of seized vehicles you said you had? Over 450 seized vehicles. Seized vehicles. And those from repeat DWI repeat, arrestees. Repeat. 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 These are repeat offenders, probably didn't even have a driver's license when you stopped them the second time. Probably. Because right, they repeat offenders right. for DUI. And you got those cars off the road <clears throat> so that they're no longer a hazard to the regular population driving up and down our streets. Congratulations for that. Congratulations to all of you for that work that you're doing. And I know you're catching other things other than DUI, it sounds like, and all, people in their cars and doing bad things that are going to hurt other people. And I really appreciate that work, and thank you very much. It's an outstanding job. Councilman McIntosh. I want to thank you all for being part of the effort that has changed the culture around drunk driving. Um, it's no longer cool, even though we still obviously have, have a problem with that. But the culture, I think culturally, it has changed, and I know my kids who are in their late 20s, they came up and, and it, they, always had a, they always had a driver. They always had a designated driver. So I think you guys play a large part in that. Now, if we can come up with mothers against fast driving to stop the speed of your neighborhood, <laughs> then we'd really be fine. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank here, you. here. Thank you. Item G2, please. Item G2, request from Smith Reynolds Airport to allow the use of rifles for wildlife control on airport grounds. Providing us with information on this item is our assistant city manager, Ms. Tasha Logan Ford. You have the floor. Good evening, Chairman Taylor, Mayor Pro Tem Burke, and members of the committee. Good evening. Item G2 introduces to the committee a request from Smith Reynolds Airport regarding additional options to help control wildlife on airport property. Our city code already provides an exception allowing the use of shotguns within 800 feet from any point on the airport boundary line. There comes some concerns that this is no longer sufficient to control the wildlife. Mr. Mark Davidson is available and he has a presentation that he's going to share with you this evening that talks about a request 
from the city to amend the city code to allow rifles with silencers as an additional option in conjunction with USDA to help control the wildlife on the property. But this time, I will have Mr. Davidson if he'll come forward and share the presentation with you. Please, Mr. Davidson, if you'd give your name and address for the record. I noticed that you were signed up to speak, so I guess you get a two for one at this time. Okay. Uh, Mark Davidson, I'm going to give you the address of the airport, 3801 North Liberty Street, Fine. considered home away from home. Right. And I appreciate the opportunity to present to you tonight. I sent a letter to Dr. Burke, and we got on the agenda pretty quick, and I'm excited to share this with you because we do have a, an issue. Um, Ten years ago, you might recall the miracle on the Hudson. Uh, wildlife strikes is not a new thing. It's been ongoing, and it's mostly birds. Uh, but at Smith Reynolds Airport, um, we're encountering some other wildlife that we need to um, um, address. And from these statistics from the um, United States uh, Agriculture Department Wildlife Services, you can see here that the number of strikes is pretty crazy. It's 194,000 wildlife strikes in the past 27 years, and I won't go through all the details, but a lot of them happen like 35% happen on takeoff roll or, or landing. Uh, at Smith Reynolds Airport, I just, this is important, we are a Part 139, FAR Part 139 certified airport. And so when we, as a certificate holder, anytime we have um, any sort of wildlife, uh, we have to do what we can to alleviate the wildlife hazards. So, and we had to do an assessment if we had a multiple strikes or damage of, of, of some sort or even engine congestion. Um, so we did an assessment back in 2012, and since that time, when the um, United States Department of Agriculture Wildlife Services did that assessment with us, we've been a partner with them ever since. And so what I want to go through is just a few quick um, wildlife strikes we've had in Winston-Salem since I've been there. And the, the first one I recall was back in April 2011, a Cessna 525 was rolling out on landing, and it's that picture up at the top, you can see the engine there. Um, there's a damage, or maybe it's too small for you to see, but uh, they hit a, a turkey on landing roll. No one was hurt, um, but there was quite some damage there. And then you can see in 2016, a very similar aircraft, a CJ-2 Citation, uh, deer strike on landing roll. Um, you can see there the front of the aircraft has a radar, like inside, to assess the weather and other uh, aircraft, and that was over 100,000 damage. And it was on landing roll, and there was no injuries, but uh, severe damage. I also want to address, this happened back in August. This is uh, pretty crazy here. A Hawker 390 was on takeoff roll early in the morning. Um, no pilot or passenger was injured, but this deer was right there in the middle of the runway, and they clipped the deer, and then they were able to abort the takeoff, and then they taxied back to the, the ramp, and then they went back out in, an, in a vehicle, and the deer was still there on the runway, and you can see that he he lost his antler. The antler is there on the on the runway, and you can see that other picture there is the damage to the aircraft wing. So it was about twenty-five thousand dollars worth of damage. Also brought here tonight, um, January fourth, um, the pilot here, Mike Boone, is in the audience. He has over twenty-one thousand hours of flight, and he was taken off, I believe, runway three three, and a deer was staring at him right there on the runway. It's just like they say, you know, startled deer looking at you. And so he was able, it wasn't the right time to rotate the aircraft, and he can tell you more if you have any more questions about it, but in his 21,000 hours, I think that's the near miss, but he was able to hop over the aircraft, or the, the deer on the runway, so that was a near miss, and so very startling. So to give you an idea of the kind of um, hazard that exists right now, the last three months, uh, every time there's a the control tower sees a wildlife on the runway, um, they, they give us a call to give the fire department, the county fire department that's based at the airport or our operations uh, or airfield maintenance. They'll give us a call and then we go out there and, and um, you know, do a, bang, a bird banger to scare off the birds or if it's a deer, honk and get them out of there um, as well as turkey. And you can sort of see the number of the operations there. It's kind of small, but the blue lines, these are days. This is the past three months and the blue lines are, are um, deer and the or, uh, the red or turkey vultures. So you can see the, the concentration. This is just over the past 90 days, the kind of issues we're faced with at the airport. So knowing this, in our great partnership with the United States Department of Agriculture Wildlife Services, um, Jimmy Capps, who's here today, did an assessment. And so they put out some cameras out on the um, near the runways and taxiways. And you can see some of the pictures here, uh, the deer um, that are there on camera. That's December, what does it say, December? 
18th of 2018 at night. And then you can see an, another there on December 29th, as well as a turkey vulture on the 15th of December. I just shared some of those pictures with you. Um, and what the assessment is telling us that there's pretty much 15 deer that they believe are, you know, causing issues at the airport and 10 are inside the fence. And most of them you can see here from this map show you the locations. They're right near our primary runway 1533, 6,655 feet. They're right there near the threshold. Um, so within 75 yards and, and I'm not the expert. I, I brought it to you uh, for consideration. I'd really appreciate y'all considering changing the code to allow the trained professionals to, to um, help mitigate this, this issue. And James, uh, Jimmy Capps here, uh, as well as his partner, Andy. And so if you have any technical questions, I'd prefer that you ask them. Um, but as a, as a employee of the airport and a, and a pilot, uh, that is the number one issue I'm concerned about with safety at the airport. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. Uh, this particular site is in the Northeast Ward, uh, so we certainly want to hear from the councilperson of the area, but if it's in order, uh, Mr. Davidson mentioned Mr. Caps and Mr. Moore, who both signed up to speak, uh, council and committee, and if it's in order, I'd like to give them a, a few minutes to, to speak to help us to make a better informed decision, and if it's the appropriate time to do so, we'll move to the public comment period. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. Uh, we'll hereby call Mr. Jimmy Caps. Uh, if you would have any comments and give your name and address for the record, please, sir. Uh, my name is James Capps. I'm a wildlife biologist with the United States Department of Agriculture's Wildlife Services out of Raleigh, North Carolina. Thanks for being here today. No problem. So um, just to kind of piggyback on what Mark's uh, talking about here, you guys, uh, there is a, a pretty serious health and human safety issue at the airport with multiple white tail multiple white tailed deer in close proximity to the runways, both the primary and secondary runway at uh, KINT at, at uh, Smith Reynolds do have white-tailed deer in close proximity to the to the active surfaces where uh, you guys have over 50,000 air operations per year. For comparison's sake, uh, this airport has taken more white-tailed deer strikes or as many as Charlotte Douglas. So uh, Charlotte Douglas, which sees well over half a million air operations per year. So it's significantly busier, but you're looking at the exact same number of wildlife strikes. So um, I, I think that our agency has the expertise and the ability to remedy this problem and uh, make the environment safer for the flying public. Um, we would, uh, you know, we've done, this at a, we've done this work at a lot of airports over a lot of years, and it's not just here in North Carolina. Our agency does this work for the military and for big Part 139 airports like Winston-Salem's airport, Smith Reynolds, and also a lot of general aviation airports as well across the nation. So this is not new to us. Um, and the FAA has a hazard score. Deer are without question the most hazardous animals you can have in the airport environment. So. Um, Typically speaking, whenever they're hit by an aircraft, they are going to incur some kind of damage. All the the three deer strikes that have happened on Smith Reynolds did incur some kind of uh, damage. I believe two of which were substantial. Uh, the twenty-five thousand dollar strike was was not substantial. All of those had the potential to be, you know, catastrophic type events or loss of life type events. Thankfully, none of them were. But there there have been people that have lost their lives and in, uh, in um, white-tailed deer strikes with aircraft. So it's certainly a, a potential. It doesn't happen that often. Deer strikes, by and large, don't happen that often. Usually it's bird strikes is what we deal with the majority of the time. 98% of the strikes that, that happen with, with aircraft are birds, but the, the small percent that are mammals or you know, deer, coyotes type, bigger type stuff has a, a much greater potential to have a, a damaging or, or catastrophic type of outcome. So, um, you know, I think that there's certainly a case to be made. Uh, you know, this this work we could we could do this under a partnership that our agency has with the state uh, Department of Transportation Division of Aviation. So it would we could do this work at no cost to the airport, which is which is certainly a, a, a good thing for the airport. Uh, there's not too many instances out there where you can get a service like this for free. And so. Um, as I said, I, mean, I, I believe our agency is the subject matter expert at dealing with these kind of problems. Um, you know, if, if you guys did green light the work, we would have a very experienced uh, group of individuals who would be out there um, performing the work. So, and 
you know, just, just to be clear, I mean, we, we want to do this work as, you know, as, as safe as possible, as humanely as possible, and, and, and cause, you know, uh, get the greatest amount of good, but, with, you know, we don't want to have any mishaps, so, you know, certainly we're not, we're not a bunch of cowboys out there. We're going to, you know, do this work in a very efficient and safe manner. So, do you have any Cap questions for me? Are there any direct questions for Mr. Caps at this time? Nothing at this time, so if you just be on, okay, uh, Council Member Adams. Hi. I um, wanted to know, I, I noticed that, uh, that the meat will be processed That's correct. and given to the North Carolina The Hunters, hunters for the Hungry. For, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. My question is, and I'm looking at the map, I'm trying to see if we have a processing center here in Winston, I mean in Forsyth County. The one that we will be utilizing, that we typically utilize, is in Asheboro, North Carolina. Okay. And I believe there, I'd have to double check, but a lot of those facilities when the deer hunting season is not in, they, they close down. Mm -hmm. So the availability of those processors, there very well could be one in Forsyth County. Um, I, I can look into it. it um, you know, is that something you're suggesting? If, you, if we do remove animals, you'd like them donated locally? Is yes, that kind of please. what? Okay. We are on the map for one of the most uh, food deserts in the country. Okay. And if we're now not following up on the other process we were following, now we got a plan B to okay. be able to provide protein to needy families. Uh, I would like to see if we're killing up deer at, in Winston, mm -hmm. I'd like that deer meat, if possible, to go to hunger centers here in Forsyth County, whether that's, you know, the food bank or other pantries okay. in in kitchens and churches and things that provide frozen food, Samaritan, Bethesda, wherever, for okay. the least of us. Well, that, that certainly makes sense. And off the top of my head, I do not know if there was, is one in Forsyth County. Um, I don't think it is. I'm look, I, I don't remember <clears throat> seeing one even when we were doing this other process. Uh, I just only, I'm looking at the map now, and I knew Greensboro had one. Yes. And then I knew that Asheboro had one, Randolph County, but Forsyth doesn't have one. And I would just like, hopefully you guys, along with uh, the airport or whoever, that you kind of help us out on this and figure out working with the many nonprofits that do this labor of love every day, mm -hmm. that we can help provide that meat to these uh, centers and, and places. I, I'm sure there is a mechanism for doing that. Um, we, we have worked with specific charities and basically kind of been a go-between for making sure that the, the meat that we, that we procure through our work basically goes to um, a, a target nonprofit. So um, I'll have to do some, some homework into that. It's been done in the past. I, I would imagine we could probably do it again. Mr. Thank Caps, if, if this item passes tonight, uh, the general process is that it will move to Monday uh, for a vote. Okay. Uh, so in between that time, if you can do a little research, if you can find out that information and make sure that you partner and communicate with uh, Mrs. Ford, who is our assistant city manager, you know well, she'll get that information to us. Uh, Madam Attorney? Uh, oh, I thought this was a... I, I thought for sure that this was an action, action. item. Thanks for the correction. Okay. That's why you get paid yeah, the big good. bucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'll certainly look into it. And if you could provide me with the list of nonprofits that it might be a good landing spot, we, can, we can probably make, make, make that line up. Thank you. So, Thank you. Okay. Councilman McIntosh. No. This is going to be primarily a one-shot deal, right? I mean, the community of, and you knock down the population, and it's figure some time before it builds back up. So this is not an ongoing, most likely not an ongoing thing, or, or I, is it? We're not going to be able to go in and get it done in one one night. Mm -hmm. just, I mean, just to be clear, it's gonna, probably going to take a couple trips, but I would not imagine this happening 20 times to to have. You know, I would imagine this is probably going to be over a series of. It, it's tough to, to pin the tail on the donkey, but it's. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a couple nights or a series of nights to get the population knocked down to where it's either acceptable or it, it's basically been reduced to nothing. Right. So, so that'll be sort of an intensive effort at the Correct. start of it, but it won't be an ongoing thing where people are hearing gunshots on a. No. You know, on a no. And we and just to be clear, we are going to be using you know suppressed rifles, so there's not going to be there, we're, there is some report, but it's not like what you would think of a traditional. Uh, Firearms discharge, right. you know. So we we've, we've done a lot of discharges around populated areas. I've never had one reported. Um, not to say that there's a possibility that it could be reported, but um, so we're we're looking at 
let's just say 15 deer, let's just take the max number. Um, that's going to take several outings, and, I, and that may be that may be two, that may be five outings to get get it to where we want it. But it'll all this work will be done at night. We'll be using uh, you know, some pretty advanced equipment to detect the deer and to remove the deer. And the, the object is to do this as subtly and discreetly as possible. So we're not shining spotlights in people's houses. We're not having big weapons discharges right behind somebody's you know place of you know of we definitely don't want to have this going on for you know, a long period of time. Well, that was going to be my next question in here. It says that you've done this, this type of operation in multiple other jurisdictions within the state. I'm wondering if you've done them in municipalities that are as densely populated as we are. I mean, we've got an awful we've got a big population right around, the, yeah. around this airport. Is that something that you've dealt with before? Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, you know, Greensboro doesn't quite have that same dynamic as far as residential stuff. So I'm just looking for some assurance Maybe. that... We, we have, we've certainly done this work around some highly populated areas before, both in the military setting and GA and the Part 139 setting. You know, we, we do a lot of work around people. You know, our, our agency is tasked with kind of mitigating that human wildlife right. conflict. So by nature, we're doing our work around people all the time. You're not so, experimenting here. That's no, no this is tried and true. And, you know, and we, we we want to do this, you know, uh, as by the book as possible. Like I said, we we strive to do this, and we, and we we, you know, we go through a lot of training. You know, we every year we're put through our NRA paces. So I mean, we have a lot of uh, XDOD members on our on our staff who, you know, so um, yeah. As I mentioned, this is not a willy nilly operation. Great, you know, thank you. So and, and Mr. Caps, uh, again, we're going to get the mayor pro temp Burke, and I think that's one of the beauties of the ward system. Uh, is that you know she will be in close communication with the people of that area to make sure everybody understands clearly what's going on and that everybody is as safe as possible. Now we've got two questions from council members and then we've got one more person to, to speak. So we're going to try to move this along as quickly as possible. So we go with Mr. Larson, then we'll oh, come you, to you, no, I'm, Mississippi. You're good. Yeah, after uh, our public comment period, then we'll go yeah, to the council members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, for for coming and uh, for the service that you would provide for free. We we love free. Um, I, I do have sort of questions though about, and this may be directed to somebody else, as to what our animal abatement program has been heretofore. I assume we've got fencing and whatever, and there's been references to shotguns being used. Um, and and I, I'm understanding from following up from Council Member McIntosh's comments that this is a surgical, high-tech, on-the-spot solution that is addressed to handle an immediate need. Uh, presumably it would not be needed again for the foreseeable future or for another year or whatever till it, it becomes a chronic situation. But could somebody explain to me a little bit about why the shotguns are not working or why our current program is now requiring us to bring in this sort of tactical solution uh, to address this problem? Are you the best person to speak to that? that? I, I'm more than comfortable with it if that's, if that's okay. So um, there, there is an intact perimeter fence at, at, the, at the airport, okay? Um, it, in places it does meet the FAA specs, and in certain places it doesn't. Um, it, it does go around the entire perimeter of the fence. Um, shotguns have some pretty, some, they're, they're designed mainly for, uh, for bird hunting, so they're not really the, the proper tool for, for doing you know, precision white-tailed deer removal. They just have a, a pretty limited range. Of, you know, I would say max, max effective range on a shotgun is going to be about 40 meters, mm -hmm. which typically deer in this environment are not letting you get that close to them. Um, so um, shotguns can be a very effective tool for wildlife abatement. Just for this particular instance, they're, they're not the best tool. Um, they are loud. These you know, shotguns are not suppressed like our rifles would be. So our rifles have give us the range and the decibel, you know, the, they don't, they're not very loud in comparison. Um, now, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys do use pyrotechnic vehicle harassment. I mean, so basically it's, it's, there's harassment measures that will make them move, but they're not going to make them leave the, the airport environment. So um, the measures that are currently employed, um, you know, they're basically um, harassment type measures that will make them leave but you know an hour later they might be back out on the runway or in, a, in an area where you don't want them to be so um, uh, as far as I know I don't think that 
the airport currently has a, a, a lethal removal program. You know, that, that's where our services come in to try to you know, get, get the numbers of deer down to an acceptable level where um, you know, the safety risk to the flying public is, is significantly reduced, if not completely removed. What so you're before. called in as needed, basically. I, I would say that we could probably, you know, get this problem addressed and buttoned up pretty well. Now, with the fence being six foot in places, or if perimeter checks are not, if the, if the integrity of the perimeter fence is not maintained, you could have deer come back onto the airfield. And then you would need to take measures to either harass them away or, or remove them. So I would, I would like to say that we could come in and in three nights have this problem taken care of and it would never pop up again. Uh, I would be telling you a lie if that was, uh, you know, because there's the potential without a, an FAA approved fence that there might be some, some deer that repopulate the area. You know, if somebody leaves a gate open one night, you could have mm -hmm. four deer come back inside come the back fence inside. and then the problem is, you know, so, um, you know, uh, somebody mowing the grass, the tractor, you know, accidentally bumps the fence and knocks a section of it down, you could have, you know, deer repopulate it. Yeah. Um, you know, if they do repopulate, and I, I think that there, there might be some latitude with you guys, what you decide on doing, but if you grant our agency permission to do this, if you have a problem again, it's usually, and if we're talking a small amount of deer one night, and then we're right. back to where we need to be at. So a follow up to the attorney. Can we do this as a one-time hunt, or does this an ordinance change to go into per perpetually in place? It was, um, I think the best thing to probably do is go ahead and do an ordinance amendment, and you can certainly revisit the ordinance in a year or two, uh, but I do think you need to look at the ordinance. And so the ordinance would be in place until we reverse it? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Uh, do you have an additional question? Oh, I just sort of add one for the airport. Why have we have fences that aren't compliant with uh, security of the airport? Mr. Davis. We've recently come out to the airport on North Liberty Street. We installed, I'm thinking it's about 200 yards of a fence mm -hmm. using what they acquire now. It has concrete underneath the base of the fence for nobody can dig under it, as well as it being eight foot or 10 foot with barbed wire. That was $150,000 for just that 200. And you're talking about securing 700 that or 700 acres. It's a, it's a lot of money to do a, a fence around there. We're committed to it. We just um, we need financial help as well. So it's in a program. It's in a program to do this though. To do fencing not. around the airport. It's always a, a priority of the airport. Okay. Thank you, Councilwoman Scipio. So this proposal uh, is just to reduce the deer population by 15. Is there any consideration of the turkeys? Uh, Mr. Cap. There, 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 there was some work that our agency was uh, attempting to do uh, with trapping the turkeys, and we were going to translocate them to Texas. We've, we've done that at other airports in the state. Unfortunately, the turkeys did not cooperate. Uh, the, no. one, the one that you saw on Mark's slide earlier, uh, I can toggle back through it. The, the, the right-hand turkey, that was the only one that we had that we consistently had. So um, now if the population of turkeys warrant, if you get enough of them there, I will be more than happy to trap those and put them on a Delta flight to Texas. I would love to do that. We tried to do it unsuccessfully, and that's actually where we really started to uncover how many deer were inside the fence was doing all this work on turkeys and then we started to kind of discover that we did have you know some more you know some more deer in there so mr davidson do you want to add something to that i did also gotcha. just going back to the fence issue at, at charlotte i believe they have fencing all the way around their facility and i worked at jackson international and they'll jump over they'll get in even oh yeah so i just want to make that clear yeah. right and, and my intent was not to, to say that they're not doing their due diligence with respect to their fencing. There's only, I think, maybe one air, one or two airports in the state that have a FAA compliant wildlife fence around the entire thing. They're extremely expensive. There was one that was just put in at Burlington Alamance. It's about, to do it right, it's about, I think it's about $800,000 per linear mile to do. So it's not, it's not cheap to do a proper wildlife exclusion fence. Um, you know, they're 10-foot high, 4-foot angled, uh, buried skirting, so I mean, they're, they're extremely expensive. Um, it, it would be nice if we could just wave a magic wand and have every airport in the state have 
proper wildlife fencing. Um, but you guys do have sections where you, you are working on it, so you're, they're, they're going in the right direction, but there is a, you know, a substantial amount of fencing to completely encompass that, that airport. So, but, but overall, I mean, the, the fencing there is, is in, Caps, in pretty if, good shape. If you wouldn't mind, excuse my interruption. Yes. I, I know that the, the council member has the floor, and I'm going to give it right back to you. Okay. I want to make sure that all her questions are satisfied, okay. if you don't mind, sir. Certainly. Ms. Scipio. Um, my concern is around the residents because there are a lot of homes very close to the airport um, landing strip. And um, since this elimination process is going to be at night, and knowing that we have curious teenagers and young adults, et cetera, um, do we alert the residents that this should this is going on so that people who might be curious that w they wouldn't be caught mm -hmm. in this takedown? I'm just, I mean, it's walking distance. I don't know how many people um, explore the airport at night, but I suspect it's a possibility. Yeah, generally speaking, general general public should not be inside the perimeter fence of, of the airport at night. Um, per our agency SOP, we always alert law enforcement of our activities prior to doing it because you know, there is the possibility of somebody reporting a gunshot. Um, so, um, you know, with with that many homes interfacing the airport environment, there there could be a potential of somebody hearing something. Uh, we shouldn't have any foot traffic inside the. Uh, and we always double and triple check all of our all of our targets with an infrared camera too, so we can kind of have a, a very good idea of not only our target, what's beyond it, and what's to the periphery of it as well. Mm -hmm. So um, we we do our due diligence whenever we're doing this work. We scout it. We know the you know where we are okay and not okay to to do the removal. Um, there's a lot of places we go to where we know that roughly 40 percent of the field of, you know, or 180 degrees of it, it's just an area that we're not going to operate in, you know, and uh, we're, I'm o we're okay with that. I, I would rather do the work in a safe and effective manner seven days a week than, than take a, a, a risky or marginal anything. So that's, that's our, that's our paramount. I mean, the safety, the, the safe operations of, of doing this work is what we, we strive for and we have a, a very good safety record and I intend to keep that safety record intact. And Ms. Scipio, to further elaborate on it, uh, since this is in the informational stage sessions, um, it might be good if they're going to notify law enforcement, maybe we can set a protocol in place to make sure that we then trigger a response to the council member and then to the community. And I think if this is something that you'd be willing to support, we can certainly put those mechanisms in place. You, you still have the floor. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Caps. You're welcome. I, I certainly appreciate it. If you just be on standby, stand by for additional questions, members of the committee, council, we have one additional person signed up to speak, and hopefully we can let him get through his comments and answer, ask any questions. So, Mr. Moore, if you'd come, uh, give your name and address for the record, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Andy Moore. I'm district supervisor with the USDA Wildlife Services Program. I'm located at 444 Bristol Drive in Statesville. And unfortunately, Jimmy stole most of my thunder. I <laughs> uh, just want to add that, that our agency does take this type of uh, activity very seriously. I was going to speak more towards the safety uh, and training aspect, which was pretty much covered. But we have been doing this for a long time. And uh, definitely uh, Jimmy Caps, who's worked with us for several years, both in California and here in North Carolina, is a very good representative and, and just want you to, just want to let you know that our, our staff is fully trained through the NRA and also spend quite a bit of time in the field doing this type of work. So thank you for the consideration. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Any questions directly for him? We appreciate your time. Uh, now we recognize Mayor Pro Tem Burt. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chair, Mr. Larson, uh, Councilwoman Scipio. Uh, Mr. Davidson has been very sensitive about the neighborhood. And I do not believe that he will be bringing a request here if it's not one that he feels will be safe and sound for the residents in the area. We know there's been a big problem and we've tried different things. And until we try this, we don't know what the end results will be, but we would hope with the information we received that it will be productive and beneficial. So I have confidence 
in Mr. Mark Davidson as the manager of Smith Reynolds that he will make sure and monitor it very carefully himself about what's going on with the deer. They do create a lot of problems. And once they hit one of those airplanes or get in the mm -hmm. way, it can create many more problems even for the people who are flying them. So Mr. Davidson, I know that you brought this. It's not something that you just looked at and said, we're going to do this. I have confidence that you have studied and reviewed it well. So Mr. Chairman, uh, what are we supposed to do this season? I heard you say something about action. What are we supposed to do? It sound, well, it sounds to me that you know we will gather information. Mm -hmm. We'll ha ask any questions that we need to ask. And if there's anything such as the mechanism to make sure we inform the community, we put that in place. Mm -hmm. Then staff will then draft an ordinance to bring back to us for us to then consider at a later committee date, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you very much. And I'm sure that uh, Assistant City Manager Logan Ford will make sure there's a great communication with Mr. Davidson. Anything coming up, all that will be given to the attorney and then the chairman and the committee then will have a chance to act. All right. Uh, have your comments been satisfied? Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard? Uh, and then the question on the floor would be, um, do we need to direct staff to bring this back uh, to, to in the form of an ordinance for us to vote on? Or are there any other concerns? Councilmember Scipio. Um, seems that in that this is a critical problem, is there a best time for this kill to take place? Or is there a season that they need to be looking for it so we'll know what kind of, how quickly we need to move on this? That's a great question. I think I have an idea of the answer, but we're going to let the, the folks who are in charge of it. If you take the podium, please, so that those who may be watching can hear you as well. We could do this work throughout the year. Um, my personal preference is to do it uh, in the wintertime when it's, when it's A, cooler, and B, the, the vegetation is off the trees and we can, we can see better. Right. Um, it, that's, but that said, we, we do have to, you know, if there's safety issues, we have to act on them, whether that's in August or in April or in December. But preferably, we typically try to do most of our work from around Thanksgiving time frame till right about now, and, and the trees are starting to green up, then we, we kind of start to, to kind of put the deer work on the back burner until the fall. But we, we can do it throughout the year. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, something else that was brought to the attention, communicating with the residents. I don't know how, uh, Mr. Davidson, you propose to make sure the residents are aware of what's going on up there. Um, yeah, the communication to the residents, uh, if that's what this committee uh, wants to do, we can work with City Council. I think you've mailed out postcards before to that zip code, and uh, we'd have to utilize our, our resources at the county or the city. Um, but going back, to uh, people walking around the airport. Uh, we have not had any knock on, on wood, any incidences, and um, we don't want to encourage anybody either. So. No. It's been a long time since uh, children or young folks have slipped on there with their little, what's those little motorcycle things to ride? Scooters. Scooters, but we haven't had or heard about that lately. Nope. Yeah. And Mayor Pro Temp, in the, la in the Public Safety Committee meetings from November 13th of 2006, it looks like that letters were and could still be uh, sent of the proposed language could be sent to all the neighborhood associations bordering Smith Windows Airport. Mm -hmm. and, and it looks here that, the, that a meeting was conducted in the Castle Knights Neighborhood Association. And so maybe we could sort of duplicate that. I mean, if it's not broke, we don't fix it. We just put the same implementation in place. We don't want to get excited because we work with another project up there. So we want to make it clear that's not our other project. Mm -hmm. This is a different subject. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Hibio. Oh. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Madam Attorney. When would you like to the Well, I, I think that May is, is a fairly good time frame. Uh, if, if it doesn't take long to draft the ordinance, I think if there are any additional concerns, just ask members of the council and committee to get with staff and let them know But we'll have this ordinance brought to us for at least uh, some sort of consideration uh, in May. And also, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Davidson and our assistant city manager will keep an open line of communication so the attorney will get what she needs. Thank you. And, and I want to say to Mr. Davidson and, and all of the airport folks, uh, we certainly value uh, your commitment to this community. I know there have been times where uh, we didn't always see things uh, eye to eye, but this council and this committee has always been open and willing and ready to support 
the work that you do, and we just appreciate the opportunity to have a partnership. So thanks for being here today with this request, and we'll consider it in May, and we'll try to move this forward uh, for uh, further consideration of the council at that time. Mr. Thank you for your time. Mr. Mayor Pro Tempur. We're sitting in a hot seat right now, Mr. Davis and I. We're praying over some things. <laughs> mm. This was a breeze compared to a couple months ago. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that completes item G2. Uh, the final item on our agenda is item G3. If you'd read that, please, ladies. Item G3, Complex Coordinated Terrorist Attack Grant Update. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, giving us information on this item is our Director of Emergency Management, Mr. August Vernon. Uh, at your convenience, you do certainly have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the committee. Let me try to open the slide here. Um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to uh, briefly update you on this pretty significant grant. Um, this slide is a little busy, but I think it does a good job of explaining a lot of different steps that are taking place with the terrorism grant that we received two years ago. Uh, as you know, with the unfortunate uh, passing of Mr. Sadler, the grant was a little delayed, uh, but we've come up with a really good plan to continue the, uh, with the grant efforts that were started. And I think it's important to remember, as you can see on the slide there, uh, August of 2020 is the end of this grant, which means several months before the end of the grant, we have to have all our documentation, reports done. We've got several audits. So we're really down to about 12 to 14 months to try to, uh, well, I shouldn't say try to successfully implement the grant. Um, so what I thought it was important to show this slide is sort of cradle to grave what, what we've done with the grant, which I would remind everyone is one of the largest that was received in the United States. Uh, we received a larger amount than Los Angeles, Dallas, Houston, a lot of much larger jurisdictions. As you can first see in 2018, once we received the grant, we had to come up with the process and the plan of how are we going to wisely spend the grant. So we had to do a what's called a gap analysis where we looked at strengths and vulnerabilities and weaknesses that we have in our community. Uh, we conducted several of those workshops with over 30 different city and county agencies, including the police department and the fire department. We did several gap analysis workshops, um, again, from representatives from across the triad. We then also had to do workshops on training specifically to get input from all the agencies on what they saw as the biggest need. So that was 2018. In 2019, we've rolled into implementing the grant process. We've already had several classes. We are planning for several different uh, exercises that will be coming up in the next few months. Um, and you can see each thing on there. Each box probably has 20 other little items under it and we just don't have time to cover all those. Um, and so through 2019, we'll be very busy with a lot of training and exercises. One that I would like to remind you is we would like to provide, be given the opportunity to present to city council to provide, provide a little bit of an update on uh, emergency operations plan and how we would respond to a crisis and the city council's responsibilities in said crisis. Into 2020, uh, we will have to conduct at least one large full-scale exercise. That'll be the big exercise, as you can imagine, with uh, hundreds of responders and lots of moving parts and pieces. And what makes it significant is we will have to do that exercise in two different locations, uh, somewhere within the triad, which certainly makes it a little more complex, but we will be able to accomplish that. So um, very quickly, um, the training that we talked about include, include such courses as command and control, incident command system, active shooters, terrorism response, cyber incidents, healthcare response, et cetera. And we do have the potential, which I think was a big opportunity, to train over 1,000 first responders and other officials using this grant over the next 12 to 14 months. Uh, we have, I don't have the exact numbers, but we have already trained over 150 first responders from across the city, the county, and the state uh, using the grant. The planning will include a complete overhaul of our city county emergency operations plan. We will also have a very detailed terrorism response annex, uh, which obviously that would not be public uh, information. The emergency operations plan is, but terrorism specific information would not be for the reasons you could imagine. 
We're also looking at several other plans, including a regional plan. Uh, those type of efforts typically take 12 to 14 months in any normal cycle, so that falls right into the grant requirements. Also exercises, we have several regional multi-agency tabletop exercises coming up, which is anywhere from 50 to 100 representatives in a room who work through multiple scenarios testing their plans. Uh, we've even spoken to some of our federal partners about that to get their support in these exercises. Uh, they did leave from the airport. We do have a full-scale exercise coming up at Smith Reynolds Airport in November. And again, that will be a larger type of grant with a terrorism focus. So again, there's a lot of activity taking place with the grant. Uh, we do have the Olson Group, which was the uh, vendor that was selected to coordinate that grant for us, and they're doing an excellent job of that. So this grant was an excellent opportunity for us as a community to better prepare for terrorism. And obviously, uh, if we can prepare for a large terrorist incident, that helps us prepare for all kinds of other things that could impact our community. Um, do you have any questions for me right now? Well, I certainly appreciate the information, uh, the overview on, on the grant. Um, I think for those who may be listening in, the purpose of all of the trainings and all the exercises is just simply to ensure that we're prepared in case of an emergency or a disaster. Now, okay. I'm going to take a major out of Mayor Pro Temp Burke's book, um, and I know 10 years ago, she asked the same question to Mr. Sattler every year. So, I mean, every, every meeting. And, and, and you hadn't got asked this question very much. So I'm, okay. I'm going to start the question by saying, Mr. Yes. Mr. Uh, Vernon, are we prepared? We are certainly are prepared, but we we'll always have room for improvement to continue preparing. I love it. Any, any questions for him? Uh, Ms. Scipio, let me come in. My concern is we have all our agencies prepared. Does this grant address getting our citizens prepared so they can help in a positive response to these kinds of issues? There is some opportunity for that. Um, this was the first time this grant has been completed by Department of Homeland Security, so they're also uh, providing us updates as we move through the process. There are some national initiatives, which is typically what you try to follow along, such as a program called Stop the Bleed, uh, which trains the public on how to use tourniquets and provide first aid. Uh, there may be some opportunities there. And again, we do provide emergency preparedness training at any time, regardless if we have the grant or not. Uh, so there may be some opportunities with the grant to do that. I really think that's important if we get the residents to be responsible during these areas. But otherwise, you have mass panic. And so that works against good planning. Yes, uh, so I hope we consider doing something that will get our residents involved in that. Yes, ma'am. Councilman Larson. Um, just remind me, because I'm old and getting senile about remembering things. Um, how m much money was this grant by Homeland Security? What was the total amount? It was a Approximately $1.8 million. $1.8 million. Yes. And so we did the study, the initial thing, which was 120000 or something for the yes. in initial assessments and work out the program. And we're now in finance. We just approved the one point, I think, seven or something for the, um, for the implementation. It was yes, a very complex project, incredibly complex. And uh, we are statewide on this, right, or is it regional? What is, what is the geographic uh, Our area? priority, obviously, would be the city and county, but the, right. the requirement for the grant is to be regional. But Re we've already had agencies from across the state and even out of state participating with us, right. and that will continue to happen. So it's, it's any big. benefit to anyone is uh, good for this. So, so we are really piloting a, a national program with this. It's the first time it's been granted. Yes, we received the grant, and the city of Durham received the grant, but ours is twice as large as theirs. And, and, and we better. make that clear all the time. <laughs> better, and we're doing more. Yes, sir. Well, I, I look forward to it. And most of these activities will be taking place in Forsyth County. These training, we're bringing people in, or we're using our own people. Is, is this generating uh, people coming into our site, into our town, into our county to, to learn these skills? Yes, yes, and yes. yes uh, the majority of it will take place in Forsyth County, but we will be moving around the triad. Do you want some travel and tourism money to go into the <laughs> pot here? <laughs> Thank you very much for doing this. I know this is, I, I've tried to follow this, and it's incredibly complex. It's just listing the areas of concern and how you manage to try to orchestrate all of that and, and bring it in 
to a larger audience is, is very challenging, but it looks like you've got a good team put together, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, my staff has been uh, all hands on deck and is doing an excellent job. I'm, I'm anxious to follow it as we develop it. Your deadline for completion of this grant is when? Uh, August of 2020. 2020, which next year. actually several months before 18 then. months out or more. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Larson. Uh, any additional questions or anything? Uh, Mr. Brennan, we appreciate this opportunity to hear about the overview of, of the you. grant. And if you just keep us posted as more information comes available. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, members of the committee and council, that concludes the general and consent agendas. Uh, it looks like Councilmember McIntosh has a comment. Can we get an update on the status of the um, location that had the shootings the other night? I know it's been on our plate multiple times over the years when we thought we had sort of put that to bed but um i know i've gotten i've been contacted by multiple people just asking what are our options going forward to to deal with what is a, a recurring nightmare over on um, on cherry street great thank you very much is there anything else that should be considered or heard for the good of the order? Thank you. Seeing nothing further, we'll consider this meeting to be adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.